Uh, oh, it's happening. There you go. No one be scared. Uh, it is great to see you. We're expecting some more to come. You're the heroes for making it. Uh, I can see we have people from Cardiff, from Cape Town, from Horsham. See, if I don't connect names to places, I don't get in trouble. Uh, the chat is ever ready. Uh, so do put in there where you're joining us from. It's wonderful to see some familiar faces. It's lovely to see some new faces. I feel like embarrassing people. I'm seeing one face uh, who I don't believe I've seen for a decade. So it's lovely to see you, Natalie. <laughs> uh, great. We're making a start. Uh, everyone is here. The chat is open. Do I need to give anyone a briefing on Zoom? I don't think so. The chat is there. You can put in anything you like there. Well, I mean, within reason, obviously. Don't be awkward. Um, this is the big day out. Uh, it's being put on by Faith in Kids. And uh, just to make sure you're in the right place, this is for those who lead children's ministry in their local church, or they oversee it, or they've just been dragged along by someone who does so that you can see a bit more of how it works. Uh, we have learned uh, that it is great to give you some help. Uh, we have uh, brought in some others to help us today with that. But we have also learned that uh, it is great to talk to each other. So uh, scattered through our time together, which we think will be between now and about half 12, uh, we'll have times in groups of, uh, I've written this down, in groups of about four to six people. Each breakout group will be the same people. So in the first one, you'll just have a chance to say hello, uh, get to know each other. Uh, nothing in this time will last longer than about eight minutes, so time will fly. Uh, there'll be a break in the middle. Uh, we are recording all of this, so if it does become tedious, you can watch it back on YouTube at treble speed, and uh, that's much funnier. Uh, but I'm delighted you've actually joined us in the flesh. We hope we'll keep you on the edge of your seats in a very positive way. Uh, people are joining us. Uh, the chat is filling up. We've got London. We've got Maidenhead. We've got White Waltham. Black Waltham is far less pleasant. Uh, we've got Kirkella in Hull. It's great to see you. We've got the Isle of Wight. Uh, we expected someone from the Channel Islands. Hello, Esther. Are you the Isle of Wight? You are. We've got Bobby Tracy. Uh, Abby, hello. I think I know the church there in Devon. One day we'll do some sort of spot yourselves on a map game uh, to see if where we can cover. Uh, it's great. Uh, well, we've got we've got Dorset and Lancashire. Well done for telling us counties. Hello, wonderful team. Ruth and Joe from Cardiff. We've got Perth, Western Australia. Look at that. I'm not sure we've had an Australian before. Sarah, tell us, is it the middle of the night from you? Uh, uh, no, it's a reasonable time. It's five o'clock, five o'clock in the afternoon. Oh, thank you for joining us, Sarah. You're, uh, I hope we don't keep you away from your tea and your family later or whatever your plans are for your evening. We'll get you away just in time. We've got Dublin. Someone from Dublin. Can you say hello to us from Dublin? Hi there. I'm Ruth from Dublin. Oh, hello, Ruth. <laughs> Ruth, it's lovely to see you. Ruth, I'll be honest. I just wanted to hear the accent. I'm delighted you've got one. It would be so I was tempted. I thought I better, oh, I need to put a real Dublin accent on right so <laughs> right for you all. <laughs> Ruth, we all would have been a bit disappointed if you'd been an English person in Dublin. Not that I don't like English people, but we're it's just very great grateful family. for anyone who comes to Dublin to help us in ministry. So I would that, not diss an accent. <laughs> that's a, that's the godly line, Ruth. Well done. I'm pleased you're here. That's better. We've got we've got Helen from the Black Country. Helen, go on. Tell us whereabouts in the Black Country is that? Helen might. Helen it's might. West Bromwich. It's West Bromwich. There you go. Look, thank you for telling us, Helen. I won't make the football football connections. It's great. Guy from Catford. Hello, guys. Lovely to see you again. Goodness, chat is frighteningly hard. Amy would like all Northerners to say where they're from because Amy would like the world to be a Northern Republic. Uh, Pete, it's lovely to see you. We got St we've got Stephen Amy, who isn't... No, he's not called Stephen Amy. Amy, we have Stephen from Sheffield. There you go. But you're, you're just as welcome if you're in the south with me. Amy and I do have a, 
<laughs> Geography with Ed. Look, I'm enjoying it. Should I stop, Amy? Amy, do you want to say hello? Everyone wants to hear your smiley voice. Morning, team. Morning, everybody. Ed, you are slightly over-obsessed with geography. <laughs> <laughs> Am I? Sorry, I just, I find it, I think I've, we've all been locked up too long. I find it thrilling, the idea we're coming together. Look, that's Looking a for, you're going to get one of those, like, um, you know, vote maps, you know, like, <laughs> night maps. He's going to that is actually what I would like. That is actually what I would like, Amy. And I don't know why that's such a funny idea. We are going to get going. Look, all, we, we believe a lot of people are in. Uh, hello, Luan from Cape Town. Look, we're, we're going global, but Kendall, Hannah and Kendall, you're just as welcome. Look, I find, look, okay, I'm the only one who's thrilled by this. I'll stop now, Amy. Thank you. Okay, let me explain. I've told you why we're here with a big day out. We exist for children's workers for those who work with children, for those who oversee children, family ministers, church leaders, we welcome all of them. This is Faith in Kids. We exist to support churches and parents in raising children to know Christ. You know that, that's why you're here. You're just thinking, Ed, how long are you gonna witter on like this? I'm gonna pray as we start. It's a pleasure to be together. I wish we could all talk and have that coffee together. Oh, one day, let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you very much that we have come from all over the world because we love Christ. We trust him in uncertainty. We pray, Father, it would be Christ we speak of as we leave. And we pray, Father, that from our brothers and sisters, we would hear wisdom that would encourage, inspire and equip. Amen. Amen. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to be opening up John 10. Uh, but I'm also going to put the text I'm doing on the screen, but I don't want anyone to feel awkward about that. Uh, I'm just going to open up John 10 to get us going, and then we're going to fly. OK, if people are still coming in, you're very welcome. So um, I am. Um, there is a book. Oh, no, sharing screen. You would have thought by now I'd be better at this. OK, there is a book that's just come out. Uh, I don't think you need to buy it. Uh, I always am careful. Ever since someone told me every Christian should own a certain book, and I really thought it was very, very dull. So I'm now careful of making uh, overwhelming book reviews. But this book came out. It's called Handing Down the Faith. Um, it's You couldn't describe it. It's not a Christian book, um, but it is research. And it's um, some people who I think are sympathetic to Christian things. They have done 235 in-depth interviews in the U.S., uh, with parents affiliated to a religion. So they've interviewed religious parents. Most of them are Christian, but not all. And they're trying to understand by talking to parents, how do they hand down the faith? Uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, I haven't got very far, and so you might be hearing more of it in future big day outs. But um, the beginning struck me because what they tried to do is they listened to parents about what they are trying to do and then they summarized everyone's interviews. So they've tried to summarize down what do parents say that they are trying to do, okay? Uh, and this is one of those summaries. I'll read this to you if you can't read. If you're on one of those little, if you're on your phone now, this is deeply annoying. Don't worry, I'll read it to you. This is what parents say is the task of parenting, okay? The central job of parents is to prepare and equip their children not only to enjoy all that is good in life, but also to successfully navigate, endure, and overcome difficulties in their personal life journeys. Okay? Parents are there to help their children navigate life. Good parents provision their children with the grounding, learning and resources they'll need to surmount life's difficulties and come out stronger and truer on the other side. How parents do this will be shaped by a lot by their own experience growing up in their families. Parents may enjoy their offspring, sorry, may simply enjoy their offspring as children, the true quality of their parenting work will be tested when their children face life's trials and tribulations down the road. So far, parents are equipping children for the journey. Parents are particularly equipping journey for the difficulties of life. You can't quite work out how it's going now because life hasn't started for their children. Okay, so broadly, we're thinking this makes perfect sense. 
The demanding task of parenting is made especially difficult by two major complications. We knew they were coming. Firstly, parents must never violate their children's ultimate self-determination nor trigger teenage rebellion. So parents must never tell children what to do because that could lead to rebellion, which is the enemy of parenting. Or secondly, oh, sorry, that's two different things. They mustn't violate their children's ultimate self-determination. A child must be who they want to be, and they mustn't cause rebellion. Two things a parent must never do. Finally, these demand that parents carefully navigate the narrow, difficult straits between lax and overbearing parenting. Okay. I'm not gonna study this, but I just wanted to highlight that as I read this, I found myself thinking, well, that makes perfect sense. That's what a parent is trying to do. But then you get to the end and you realize those two great enemies of parenting are rebellion and stopping children from being themselves. And you realize how difficult this must be. This model of parenting where you've got to raise children for life, but you can't interfere and you can't say anything that might cause rebellion. That sounds very, very difficult to me. The reason it's so difficult is because it's all about the child and it's not about Christ. But I found this a challenge because I did find myself thinking, this sounds exactly right, except it's godless. In John 10, we read that famous verse in verse 10 that I find myself quoting a lot in what faith in kids is trying to do. We want people to hear Jesus. He took that in isolation. You would broadly say, that's what we've just read in that paragraph. We want children to have a good life. If we only took that verse, look what we'd miss out on. Jesus says to have that life to the full, this is what we need to understand. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I love lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheepfold and I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there'll be one flock and one shepherd. Life to the full means knowing you're in a flock with a shepherd. Without a shepherd, you are a lost sheep. Parenting, ministry, is about giving people Jesus. It's about showing people the shepherd. You may know that at the beginning of the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Jesus saw the crowd and it says his guts ached, literally. In our translations, it talks about he had compassion on them. His guts ached because they were like sheep without the shepherd. When Jesus sees parenting without Christ at the heart, when Jesus sees ministries without Christ at the heart, when Jesus sees children without Christ at their heart, his guts ache. Because to be like sheep without a shepherd is to be lost. Uh, my son is in, his is in his first year of secondary school. He came back with a religious studies piece of homework uh, and in class, they'd filled in the sections of what is Christianity and his homework was what is Hinduism. The box of what is Christianity said. Christians believe there'll one day be judgment and good go to heaven and bad go to hell. Full stop. My son and I had a great conversation this morning. We, uh, <laughs> we did a whistle stop talk of, of uh, Romans 3, 21 to 26 which agrees there'll one day be judgment, but no one is righteous. Jesus alone is good enough. At the cross, a swap took place. Tom and I chatted it through. Then Tom and I prayed together. He has to decide what he'll say to his teacher. Will he put up his hand? Will he say it before the lesson? Will he say it after the lesson? But we talked about how sad it would be if that's what everyone thought Christianity was. That's all we have to offer. 
It's very sad. In uncertainty, we offer Jesus as our good shepherd. As always, at the big day out, we try and open the Bible for 10 minutes at the beginning. And I always finish by saying, if you stop now, you'd probably be doing very well. Uh, we will try and tell you how to minister with Jesus as your good shepherd for the time we're together. But this is the only thing you need to know. To minister in uncertainty, point people to their good shepherd. Why don't we just have uh, 20 seconds of quiet? And then I'll pray. Father, thank you that Jesus came, that we may have life and have it to the full. We thank you, Father, that we do not have to navigate that path alone. We thank you that we do not have to explore life to the full and make sense of it on our own. We thank you that parenting is not equipping children to explore that journey on their own. We thank you, Father, we are not left as lost sheep. We thank you that we have a shepherd. He is our shepherd, and we have a good shepherd to offer others, everyone, anyone. Father, we pray that as we continue to minister in uncertainty, as we continue to put the pieces back together, as we continue to love families, as we continue to minister to children, would we know how to do that above all else? Would we have insight into how we offer Jesus Christ? Amen. Amen. Uh, well, this is thrilling. <laughs> uh, we have got a straw poll now, and uh, the purpose of this is to get our brains whirring uh, as we just get into where we're at now. Uh, a straw poll is now going to pop up. Uh, you each get to fill it in. Uh, it's totally anonymous. Um, uh, here we are. It should be on your screen now. Uh, first question, do your church's ministry feel in settled patterns? Or do they feel temporary or transitory? So that's just to say uh, we are in different stages, uh, feeling different things. We're coming back together. We're opening up our buildings. Do we feel like we're in a settled pattern now? Do we feel what we're doing is temporary, which is we know what we're doing. We're going to keep doing it. Uh, we don't know what's next. Is it transitory? We're on the way to some lost families, gained families, lost and gained. Uh, and thirdly, last question, are any of these being re-examined in your church? So that's to say, are any of these ministries, you can tick mm, as many as you like, but uh, if you're going back to normal, if you were, you don't tick it. You tick it if there's a moment where you're just saying, stop, before we start again, I wonder how we should be doing these. I wonder if we should be doing these. I wonder which we should stop. So I'm asking you, uh, are any of these being re-examined right now? Uh, if not, I think you can just submit. I'm not sure if you have to tick one. We'll find out, okay? And then you submit, well done. Uh, I'm sure everyone is doing it. <laughs> now, uh, I think I do a, a sort of countdown and then you'll have to have finished and then the results flick up and I'm never clear whose screen they flick up on. Uh, uh, no, they don't flick up on my screen. So we'll keep going and at some point we'll discover what they say. Okay, I promise I'll tell you. Uh, we are now going to go to our, oh, I've got them on my screen. 
Are they on everyone's screen? Look at that, it's fun. Are they on everyone's screen? Isn't that good? Okay, let's take a moment. I love finding out what people say. Transitory mainly, which means we are on our way through. We're heading somewhere else. Since lockdown, it seems like most of us have lost and gained. And we all ache. If we're in families ministry, we ache for those we've lost. I don't know why you're laughing, Amy. It's very off-putting. Are any of these being re-examined? Well, look, the answer is a lot that's of what I was laughing at. I was laughing oh. at the number of re-examines. Oh, okay. That's what we're all re-examining. Not losing families. That is heartbreaking. Okay. We're examining lots of things. The majority are examining midweek groups and, uh, and children's ministry teams. I'm amazed it's only 57%. I think the common story is we don't have a children's ministry team. We're trying to put it back together. Uh, I do want to say, I think this is an encouraging story. Re-examining, asking what we need to be doing, asking what we should be doing and asking how we should be doing it is healthy, but it's difficult. And that's why we're here today. That's what we're going to be trying to look at and helping you with today. Thank you to those of you who are nodding. It encourages me. We're now going to go to our breakout groups. OK, uh, I'm just going to give you a couple of questions. They're the obvious ones. Please introduce yourselves. Please say a little about where you are. It's geography, but I think it matters. Please say how you're feeling. I think it would be great to just share one particular situation or question you have. Uh, is there one thing you're re-examining more than anything else? Uh, is there one question you're asking? Share that in your group, because it may well be that group can help you. While we're in our breakout groups, I'm going to fix my Wi-Fi. I'm sorry it's crackling. OK, Anita vortexes us into breakout groups. These are going to last about eight minutes. Plenty of time. Have a chat. See you in a moment. OK. Great, we're all here. Now, um, I would actually, although we've only just done introductions, I still think it's helpful just to hear somewhat, someone else's voice other than mine for a moment. So um, uh, you t tell us literally anything. So um, is, there a, is there a question? So, no, no one is going to say yes themselves. Uh, so you're going to have to tell us what someone else said in your group. Uh, unless you're South African and Australia and you have a different cultural system where you are allowed to talk about yourself, that must make life a lot easier. So uh, just tell us a question someone asked, a situation someone talked about, a thing someone said that made you laugh, cry or smile. Someone else just talk for a moment. That'd be lovely. I reckon we've got time for at least six people to fire out some stuff. Unmute yourself and go. I'll go, Ed. Uh, so... Um, for the sake of caring for a reduced staffed uh, children's volunteer team, we've gone to every other week doing an all age service. Um, so, and the concern is that all age actually means young, but it, and so that off puts sort of adults, teenagers, and even the kids aren't all that engaged. Um, and many kids are still staying at home. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Uh, that is a great question to be asking. How do we make all age services truly accessible for all ages? Thank you, Steve. Brilliant. Steve has set the, he, he started perfectly. Thanks, Steve. Someone else, what are you asking yourselves? What are you discussing in your breakout group? Um, hi, I'm Katie. Um, my group kind of had a couple of themes really of, we all know we want to um, get people back on Sundays and we want to provide good training, but we don't want to overwhelm people um, or set expectations too highly on people who it's not their jobs um, to teach kids. So just about how to kind of get that balance of helping people feel equipped and able to do what we're asking them to do, but not feeling obliged to do everything and just overwhelmed, um, particularly when for a lot of people, things have been much calmer over lockdown. We don't want to overload people. Katie, brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, Amy, I will all remember a slot Amy did in a recent big day out, which is we are about people, not events. We are about caring for people. We're about equipping people. We're about encouraging people. Katie, thank you so much. Someone else, this is going well. I knew it would. Question. Small, hello. Oh, yeah, small church ministry. Um, we're in a revitalization. Um, 
how to <laughs> how to minister to a vast age spectrum of children where it seems like you've got one kid in each age category um uh, particularly thinking uh, sunday school is quite easy to manage in terms of younger kids altogether but the older uh, more kind of youth style kids who wouldn't be in sunday school how to um disciple them well but also with a desire to reach out to the community in a way when they've got totally opposite interests and everything like that so that would be our question <laughs> thank you barnaby thank you I, uh, I i'm fighting all urges to say anything but this is brilliant to pose those questions and i saw people nodding as you were explaining that barnaby amy is, is frantically putting things in chat mainly saying why doesn't everyone else put things in chat someone else does someone else want to talk to us this is lovely Um, it, um, here from Cape Town, I'm not going to speak about myself, um, um, Rebecca and I were in a group together, just, you know, no more like a podcast conversation, um, but uh, she was, you know, speaking about uh, raising up teams um, and how to do that in a pandemic, um, kind of, um, you know, being one-on-one -on -one with people, getting to know them and where the gifting is, and helpful just to hear her and how she's raising her teams up, which is cool. Thank you very much, Luan. Thank you. That's perfect. Speaking up to explain, we are looking to raise up teams because it's not about us. And if we can find leaders of teams that aren't us, all the better. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Can we, Matt, can we squeeze out two more? Because these are so encouraging to hear. Um, just uh, noticed in my group that there were a number of us who are either new to the church that we're in or new to the particular role that we're taking on and that has its own level of being slightly overwhelming at the same time as trying as that team's feeling a bit fragile we're not necessarily quite sure what we're doing thanks cory and that mu that must be a common situation in the, in any 18 month period you would expect some people to join some staff to arrive and it's harder to arrive my own church has a children's and youth worker who's just arrived i hope a lot of people are putting uh, a lot of love into those people. Uh, well done, that is difficult. It's difficult to lead teams when you're just working out who, who is in the church. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane, for explaining that equipping, oh, it went just as I was reading that, it's so annoying. Equipping and encouraging people to teach about Jesus and the Bible. Well done, Jane, thank you. One more, I said we'd get two more. Is, there, is there one person willing to speak? It's excellent to hear from you. I think in our group, we just talked about how it's um, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It might have even been you, Ed, that said it at the last um, Faith and Kids, but we're desperate to kind of get going again. But if we sprint, if you sprint in a marathon, you won't fulfill it. You won't complete. So it's about taking it slow and steady and um, recognising that people are still really fragile. Um, and like Amy said, people are waiting for their boosters as well. So some people, I've currently got COVID, so I and I've been vaccinated. So I think a lot of people are still very cautious, particularly now. Children seem to be the super spreaders. If you got kids in schools, you'll know that that's where it's going. So children's ministry workers are a bit cautious, I think. But yeah, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Thank you, Rosie, and and that is partly also because. Um, in these conversations, we must remember that we are not the good shepherd. The responsibility is not on each of us in here to make their church get it right right now. Thank you, Rosie. We, we, we are not the Messiah. We are an under shepherd. We're doing our best. And uh, we would love to still be doing our best in three years time. Thank you, Rosie. This is this is absolutely fantastic. We could do this all day uh, and we will. Well, not quite. Uh, I'd love you to write down four words in front of you, if that's OK. I'd love you to write down in this order. Gospel. Gospel. I'm not going to check your spellings. Vision. Thank you, Anita. Ministry. Conflict. We've written down four words. They are gospel, vision, ministry, conflict. You can draw a picture next to each one if you want, okay? That's your challenge. 
I think these are four principles of how to make a start in uncertainty. The first one is gospel. The first one is the good shepherd. The first one is we are about the gospel before we are about teams, before we are about the church, before we are about our salary, before we are about justifying our existence. We are about the gospel. We start there. That is what is emblazoned across our heart. And that is what we wake up thanking the Lord for and go to bed praying for. OK, in uncertainty, we have the gospel. Secondly, vision. Your church has a vision that is unique. You may not have written it down on a piece of paper. Uh, one of my colleagues, Chris, is going to talk more about what vision means in a moment. But that is your church is going somewhere unique. There is a prayer your church has for what your church will look like in five years time. Where you are heading and where you are starting, that affects what you do. So some people in your groups will have great ideas of what to do. They'll tell you inspiring stories of how they have decided what to do with their Sunday school, all age service. It's brilliant to hear those stories. You can't assume it should be your story because their church's vision that where their church is at and where their church is going is different to yours. Gospel, vision, where are you at and where are you going? Thirdly, ministry. So what will we do? How will we love people? What will we stop doing? What will we start doing? In other words, this is the decision we all want to make. It comes third, not first. It takes time to get through the first two. It takes teamwork to work out the third. It takes other people to help you know you can't sustain that. If you start that up now, you won't still be doing this in six months. It takes other people to help you work out, what do I do now? Gospel, vision, ministry. Fourthly, none of us want to say it out loud, conflict. As soon as you make a decision, as soon as you re-examine, some people are going to be unhappy. You are going to be unhappy. Some people will get angry and send emails they shouldn't have sent. And if they'd reflected on it a bit longer, they wouldn't have sent. Some people are going to say things you wish they hadn't said. And some things will hurt and some things will make you wonder why you'd ever bothered trying. It is inevitable because doing good things will always upset some people. And that's why we come back to the gospel. And it's why we come back to the vision. The decision you made was for the gospel because we're going somewhere. And those people are unhappy. It could be that you are discovering in them and they are discovering in you something that is slightly out of kilter. And that conversation would be so useful to have. Pick the time carefully. It might not be you that has it. But let's just ask the question. Let someone else ask the question. Tell me why you feel that. What is it about the gospel? What is it about our vision as a church that you're not on board with or you are on board with? And I might be learning from this. Gospel, vision, ministry, conflict. Well done. Throw something in the chat, ask a question, wonder out loud. And Anita's even told us how to spell those four words. Thank you, Anita. Uh, I've invited, we have invited along uh, Matt Beebe. Uh, Matt, could you just start by telling us uh, where do you live, what church do you lead, and what's your family like? Ed, hi, morning everyone, great to be with you. Um, uh, I live in a place called Gerrard's Cross, which is in leafy uh, South Buckinghamshire, just outside the M25, Junction 16. Uh, I lead um, the church here, which is St James, Gerrard's Cross, so we are a sort of affluent commuter belt uh, parish church. Um, uh, you come to Gerrard's Cross for schools and leisure and a bigger garden and to get out of London while still being sort of close enough to London to enjoy it. And um, what that basically means as a church is uh, we wrestle with all the same issues as any other church. Uh, alcoholism, uh, debt worries, uh, mental health, marriages and all that sort of stuff. But because we're a fairly affluent area, we're better at covering it up than most people. So we hide it well on a Sunday morning, but it's still all going on. 
uh, underneath. I'm married to Amy. Uh, we have three kids uh, straddling primary and secondary school, and we've been here two and a half years. Thanks, Matt. Matt, I've asked you along just to, just to give you one insight into how you are making decisions at the moment, how your team is making decisions. Uh, just uh, t tell us uh, one way you're thinking about it right now. Yeah, um, uh, it's mildly amusing, somewhat ironic to be here because um, I, I used to think I was a clear thinker. And over the last 18 months of COVID, every, every day that goes by, I've, I feel more muddled and more dithery in my decision making. Um, uh, I, so what I found helpful uh, with our team here in the last few months is um, the power of the wandering sheep in Matthew 15. I'm not going to give a talk on it. I don't think that's what you've asked me to do, Ed. But uh, I think the context, particularly in Matthew 15, is, is less about looking for the lost and more about um, uh, going out to bring back those who are straying from the flock. And what, what we're seeing at the moment at St. James um, are lots of sheep who don't really understand that they actually belong to a flock. In other words, sheep who have wandered because they haven't understood what church is and that they actually belong to something that is bigger than just them. Uh, we're also seeing sheep who can't see that they're not in safe pasture. In other words, people who have wandered away from church because they lack the discernment when it comes to kind of what they're feeding on spiritually. So we've got lots of very digital, very online Christians who are sort of doing church on their own out there on the internet and have drifted from the flock. And then we're also seeing sheep who are so weak that they're unable even to feed themselves. In other words, they have drifted so far from the flock that is church that they don't even know how to find their way back. So they're relationally isolated. So I'm struggling to come back to church because I don't really have any friends there anymore. I don't, I don't really know who's going to be there when I come. And we are seeing a whole raft of issues um, just in the last few weeks. Uh, divorce, uh, death, redundancy, mental health, alcoholism, debt, marriage struggles. Um, and particularly thinking about children's work and young people, a, a real crisis of confidence and clarity in parenting around how we do discipleship in the home so uh it feels horribly intimidating and the issues feel overwhelming um what we're uh thinking about quite a lot is we need to give people time to recuperate and i think as a team we're learning um that means lots of listening lots of relationship lots of cups of coffee lots of very small ordinary ministry uh, I have no diagram to give you of how to build a scalable model and all that sort of stuff. I, I, we are going right back to basics of just going for a walk with someone to allow him to talk to you for an hour where you may just listen for an hour and then pray with him sort of thing. So we need to give people time to recuperate. And as I'm sure you're all finding, asking people to come back and serve, that is just a step too far uh, at the moment. Right now, we're just asking them to come to church on a Sunday and that feels big for them. So we've got to go really patiently on the recuperating thing. And then we're also trying to re-envision people. And again, what we're learning there is um, we, we did a couple of vision events a couple of weeks ago that went really well. But what we are learning is a neatly packaged vision with slides and graphics and a, a brilliant presentation and so on only takes you so far because it, it's too much for people to cope with. And so what we're finding is the way to try and re-envision people is person by person or group by group, just get some ministry going that they might come to and receive from or even be involved in helping to run. And they begin to think, oh, OK, I, I can see what you're doing there with the kids. That was quite good, actually. We had a lady, Stephanie, the other day. She's committed to come and help with our youth work a couple of Sundays a month. She's come in and, and seen it and then spoke to our youth worker and said, could I come on the Sundays when I'm not rotated on? Because it's so good what you're doing. In other words, just by getting her to dip a toe in the water, that was how she then got the vision for what it is. Whereas standing at the front with a, a shiny brochure saying what we're going to do, I think is um, not as helpful as we might have thought. So um, I guess our big thing, uh, perhaps the big thing I'd sort of share with you is this sense of going back to basics. Uh, this ties up brilliantly, Ed, because you were talking about the Good Shepherd earlier. Um, I am. I, um, I think when I think of sort of the good shepherd, I think because I watch Countryfile, I understand shepherding. 
Um, uh, so on country file, they either have the shepherd on the quad bike. And I, that's my kind of shepherding because the shepherd doesn't have to break sweat. He's got a well-oiled machine. It's powerful, it's efficient, it's scalable. You know, that's big church sort of ministry. I like that. Um, uh, or they give you the other kind of shepherding, which is the guy with the sheepdog. And just with a few delicate whistles, the dog does exactly what he wants him to do, uh, what he wants. Uh, and then and the sheep are just brilliantly rounded up. And again, I love that kind of shepherding because it's it's all about the control of the leader and getting the sheep to behave exactly as he wants them to do. But my big insight for you um, as a Hebrew scholar or whatever you want to call it, as a Greek, New Testament Greek scholar is, I don't think either of those forms of shepherding existed in the first century when Jesus talked about being the good shepherd. I think the kind of shepherd he had in mind in Matthew 15 was the guy who goes after the wandering sheep and finds a sheep who is so weak that it doesn't know how to feed itself or find its way back to the flock. And so he grabs it by the feet and puts it over his shoulders. And the sheep probably kicks and scratches and bites, but the shepherd carries the sheep back to the flock. Now, the thing about that is it's not scalable. It's not about building teams and um, me drawing a diagram. It's, uh, as somebody said earlier, a marathon, not a sprint. And so what we are putting a big emphasis on uh, as a team is uh, that one-to-one -one ministry that is slow, humanly speaking, very ordinary, not at all scalable, um, not very impressive, but we are finding that uh, it's what people need. Uh, I think of a couple, Nick and Claire, I had a coffee with Nick back in the summer. I hadn't seen him for the whole of lockdown. He openly told me he'd been watching another church. Um, I tried not to let that crush my self-esteem. <laughs> We had a coffee. He told me a bit about his marriage life at home. I kept in touch with him over the summer, uh, invited him to church personally at the beginning of September, had a conversation with his wife. Um, I now speak to them every Sunday when they're at church. There have been a few tears. Uh, I invited them personally to our vision event. I don't think they'd have come had they not had a personal invitation because I invited them. They came. Um, uh, made sure I spoke to them there. And then the other day after church, a few more tears in response to the sermon. Lovely conversation. I said, how can I pray for you? One of them said, oh, nothing much really. And the other said, please pray for our marriage. And I was absolutely thrilled that one of them felt able in front of the other with me to express that level of sort of vulnerability. They have two daughters who are hanging on just about in our children's work. Now, what I've just shared with you there isn't scalable. <laughs> you, can't, you can't quickly scale up. But we're learning as a team that that's about where people are at. They need our time and our, our care. Let me stop there, Ed. Does that help at all? I have, I have one question, Matt. That was terrific. Matt, my one question is, um, what if we feel intimidated about going for that walk? Because speaking to a group of 10, uh, asking everyone in for a cake, is, feels easier than taking one person for a walk sometimes. If they're, if they're a friend, if you have history, it's easier. Can you just help us with, with how we might get across the threshold if that conversation feels like a big ask? Yeah, thank you, Ed. Um, I think it doesn't have to be going for a walk one-to-one. -one. I get that that can be intimidating. Um, uh, there are age dynamics. There are, in our context, there are lots of power dynamics about age and wealth and where you are on the ladder and all that sort of stuff. So I think it doesn't have to be a one-to-one. -one. I think it can be a small group thing. Um, I, I think, um, I, what, I tell you what we're finding. Um, I think you keep casting out the net and you see who comes in. So I, I tried to have a coffee with some people the other day and was politely given a brush off that basically said, we're fine, thanks. And we don't particularly want to spend some time with you. Um, so I think just be prepared for that essentially rejection, but keep casting the net because I have been surprised by the response I've had from some. So I'm often reminded, you know, Jesus says it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. And with, there are some who realize they're sick and would be thrilled if you dropped around uh, with a little note. I write notes to people all the time. It's a, it's a foot in the door. Um, I think there are some people who'd be thrilled if you dropped around with a, a note and a box of brownies and said, look, I'd love to catch up sometime. Some of them won't give you a second look, but, but some will. Uh, that's not a brilliant, it's not a silver bullet answer, Ed, but it's, uh, um, I think I want to say keep trying because some 
some sheep realise they need the help. Uh, thank you very much. Um, the sadness here is that we um, is that we would all love to put up our hand and either share a story and ask you a question. S sadly, we can't. People are putting things in the chat, uh, and people people are thanking you, Matt, and uh, agreeing and saying. Uh, Jane mentioned a colleague she has. Jane is saying for her she gets this, but perhaps a colleague needs to just slow down, stop, and start from the beginning again. Thank you very much. Do keep on putting things into the chat. Matt, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, uh, we're going straight to Amy now. Uh, Amy uh, is on our team. Uh, she's part of the Faith in Kids team. And uh, Amy is going to talk a little about doing ministry in weakness, which um, anyone would think this was planned. Uh, the way Matt is saying, a lot of those we're talking to are feeling weak. And Amy's going to talk to us a bit about when we are feeling weak. Amy, thank you. Off you go. Hi, so um, I am Amy. I work for Faith in Kids. Um, I just want to ask, do any of you enjoy having the unexpected visitor that comes to your door? Perhaps you're just sitting down to watch a movie, you've got snacks ready, the blanket on your knee, and you're about to press play and there's that ding dong at the door and you think, oh, seriously? Or maybe you've just closed the last bedroom door and you're sneaking downstairs for a cup of tea on the sofa and there's a... And you think, oh, really right now? I wonder how you cope with the unexpected visitor. I've given you a little bit of a hint that it's not my favourite thing. A book that I've been reading recently on suffering describes that moment that Mr. Hardship arrives at your house as the unexpected visitor. So ever the children's work are ready for the prop. That moment that Mr. Hardship arrives and he comes into your house unexpected, uninvited. You knew he was visiting the area, but you secretly hoped he wasn't going to come to your house. And he comes in and he goes into every single room and rearranges the furniture so that nothing is where it was before and your life is unrecognizable chaos. That's how it has felt for a lot of us in ministry, thanks to COVID. That's how it has felt for our family over the last year. It has felt like we are living in a drama that no one gave me the script for. Everyone else seems to know what's going on, but I don't. And this chaos is hitting everywhere. For us in our family, it's been about walking with our son through a mental health breakdown, through watching him struggle with anxiety and depression and finding it really hard to cope. And it has been heartbreaking as his mom to watch, and it's been hard to walk through. And it has meant that I have felt like our life is in chaos. So how possibly can I help anybody else? I need to crawl under a rock and do nothing, nothing at all. Just what can I do to help anybody else? I'll crawl under a rock and I'll come out and I'll do something when my life looks a little bit more. Picture postcard, perfect. Now, there has been changes that we have needed to make in what we do as a family. I have needed to step back from things and spend more time at home and support my kids and support my husband and do things differently. That's not really what I wanted to talk to you about today. I wanted to talk to you about that principle of just feeling. I've got nothing to offer. Who am I to tell anybody anything? I want to share with you what's been particularly helpful to me. Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. This is Paul talking to the believers there, reading from verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we have ourselves been comforted, are comforted by God. Paul's just said, how am I able to help anybody? Well, because I've suffered. How am I able to help anybody because I've suffered and I've known God's comfort? So because I've suffered and I've known God's comfort, I can offer other people the comfort that's helped me. 
Verse 5, for as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken. For we know that as you share in, your, in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Listen to Paul's honesty. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experience in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Blimey, that's honest, isn't it? Indeed, we felt that we had received a sentence of death. But are you ready for the mic drop? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. That was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. I can stand at the end of a very tough year with our family and say, this has taught me more than anything else in my life to rely on God and not myself. To trust him and not my own ability to fix things. In whatever situation, whatever has meant your life has felt a little in chaos, that you felt weak, this verse nine is true. This is to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. And if you're thinking too hard, too much, too difficult, too much waiting, too much trusting, unfixable, God who raises the dead. There is no problem, there is no hardship beyond his redemption. So as you are standing in the wreckage of whatever your ministry with leaders gone, with what are we going to do next, be a safe place for people to share. Share yourself, what's comforted you. Point others to Jesus, to the hope that you've had. Know it yourself so you can share it with others. Because for a lot of people, the reason they don't want to come back and get involved, they don't want to commit to anything, is because they're not okay. And you're probably not okay either. And that's also okay. We can come to God, who is the father of all mercies, abundant in comfort. We can rely on him and we can start to have the conversations with one another where we say, what does the next step look like? What does relying on God look like in this situation or just this next day? What has helped me? What does God, how is God's word encouraging me? What is there to pray? Let's do that together. Let me just pray. Father, thank you that you are just that. You are the God of all comfort, that in Jesus we have hope. Thank you for all that we have struggled with, for all that frustrates us, for all that makes us weak. Thank you that you use it to help us rely on you. Help us to do that. For Christ's glory. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Amy, thank you very, very much. Um, let me, uh, I'm just going to give you a recap of where we've got to. Uh, allow your brain to shake down a little. Um, and then we're going to go into a breakout group. And the question in the breakout group is, what has struck a chord? What might a next step be? Okay. Uh, I've talked about gospel, vision, ministry, conflict. Uh, is, is one of those harder than the rest? Uh, does one of those strike a chord that needs a bit more thought? Uh, Matt has been telling us what it is to know that the sheep are scattered and it's hard to bring them back. Uh, it requires an individual touch, going back to the beginning, which takes too much time. Uh, what stops you from doing that? Uh, what stops you from suggesting that to others? Uh, and indeed, is that the right thing right now? And then Amy has talked to us about what it is to know that God has purposes in our weakness. 
as we find ourselves unable to do all we wish we could. Uh, is that your story? I kind of want to say, of course it is. <laughs> uh, but does that strike a chord? Does that correct your thinking? Okay, uh, that's where we've got to so far. Uh, we're going to go to a breakout group uh, for eight minutes again. It should be the same one you were in last time. Uh, you're in charge of your own breakout group. Uh, you decide what struck a chord, what might be a next step, what is helpful, what isn't helpful, what isn't the case with you, okay? I'll see you on the other side, and uh, just after this, we'll have a quick chat, and then we'll take a break, all right? We Not can. many of us have made it. Now, uh, people are coming back. If you're in first, that means you have to tell us what you've just been talking about. You've had longer to build yourselves up. OK, uh, so no one feels scared. We, we are we are three minutes away from a break. OK, three minutes away from running around your, around your flat, doing star jumps and having a cup of tea. In those three minutes, I'd love to hear from as we would all love to hear from as many of you as possible, um, because the last time we did it was wonderful and it will be this time, too. So um, again, speak for yourself, speak for others. You do not have to bring deep, insightful wisdom to the table. Tell us the questions you're asking, tell us the thoughts you had, tell us the conversation you had. Who's up first? Hi, Ed. <laughs> um, so I think relationships, uh, I think is key. Uh, getting to know uh, the families, getting to know the kids. And it's not just reliant on me as the kids worker, but all those that are in the groups. So those that are running our primary school age group saying to them go and, go and speak to those families after the service go and invite yourself around for for afternoon tea um so the relationship building it's not just me but it's those in those groups um getting to know the kids because then they'll have more fun on a sunday teaching those children if they know the families and know them the kids will want to come along and be more engaged if they know those that are teaching them so um, i think relationship how, how was the gp last week is everything okay or how was school oh how was how was that project you did? What did the teacher say? So it's relationship building, I think, is, is key to, to bringing people into the flock as well. Lizzie, thank you very much. Uh, who would like to go next? Tell us what you enjoyed talking about. We talked some about um, yeah, the balance with being doing children's ministry between um, doing that kind of uh, back to basic stuff with young people and with children or with um, people in our teams or people we would like to be in our teams uh, or with families and and obviously that's a lot of uh, a lot of people and that there's not so many of us and and it was really encouraging for me to hear from some of the others in the group about how hard they found that but also how beneficial it had been when when they had been able to kind of do that with with people and uh, yeah it was encouraging and challenging thank you Stephen uh, Abby has typed in, and just to be clear, typing in is a great solution. Uh, Abby typed in the, 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 about the overwhelming feeling that comes from wanting to re-establish relationship with those who have wandered with a small ministry team. So, so uh, if you are here, if you've given up your morning, I'm sure you're like Abby, which you, f you feel the burden. You, you, you love the families you're not seeing, and you're desperate to help. Uh, and Abby's just clarifying, there is only so many conversations we can have. And, uh, and, and the Lord is the shepherd and he is the only one who can put people back together. Thank you, Abby, very much. Anyone else just want to chime in? Yeah, I think... Ruth, go first, and then whoever the other voice was can join in afterwards. We want both. Ruth, go first. Thank you. Just talking similarly about seeking to re-establish relationships with those who've wandered and the tension of seeing on social media that they're having a great life and it's not clearly not a COVID fear that is preventing them coming back to church. And simply, I suppose I was encouraged inviting people to meet up for a chat. We've got the dynamic though of we are, most of us I think, in a more formal ministry role. And so it is a little bit like the minister coming to check in. Mm. And there's an element of we can't get around that. Mm. But that is, but nevertheless, seeking to just genuinely check in and encourage and see where that goes. Yeah. Uh, part of the recast, casting the net and being prepared for rejection. Thanks, Ruth. And I thought it was helpful what Matt said is, as the church leader, he is ready to have conversations where he says nothing and he only listens. 
I think, Ruth, the point you're making is true, is that people can feel nervous that they're getting a knock on the door from you. I think if we, if we, if we listen a lot, that might reassure them we, we're not coming to fix them. We're not coming to lecture them. Thank you, Ruth, so much. Who was next? Who was talking? Have another go. Um, yeah, I just w w struck by that sense of, you know, reaching out to people and being in a small ministry team is, um, you know, we, we show our dependence on the Father by praying. And um, and actually, that's one we can we can pray for a lot of people. Um, you know, we can pray for people and be depending on the Lord for those um father ordained moments where you might connect with someone and um you know just i guess relying on the lord's leading for who to reach out to and when and having those appointments that are ordained by the lord thank you ali thank you uh ed are we allowed any more Yes, go Pete, go Pete. Um, it's a slightly alternate view to this. It's just struck me during this conversation now. Um, and I think it's right that we need to listen and be gentle and people are worried and we care and love them, that sort of stuff. But there are also some, I think, that actually getting them to do something will encourage them to come back. Now, if they're struggling in the faith, you don't want them teaching in Sunday school, but there's one couple I can think of. They're good at turning up when they're on the rotor. So I'm almost tempted to put them on stewarding every Sunday um, because they know there's a need. Um, and if they weren't on it, then they would just result back to just watching online because if it's easier for them so just thinking for some people um actually giving them a role to do will help get them through the threshold and then they reconnect and within that work very hard at them reconnecting relationally with people in church i think actually no, i want to come to church um so there is also uh some that perhaps that's the the motivation to help them to uh, to get back coming to, along as a whole family or individually, begin to do something. <laughs> Pete, thank you. Pete, get them, get them to do something. You heard it here first. That there is, uh, Pete, we're all in agreement. It's tempting to laugh at you, but we're all in agreement. There is definitely a group of people who give them a job, they'll come. Thank you. And uh, as we always say at the big day out, you know your families, your church better than we do. So you get to answer Pete's challenge of who would, who, who needs a job, who needs a walk? I bet you know the answer to, I bet you can tell between them. Pete gives them a job. Very good. Thanks, Pete. One more. One more. Are you itching, bursting to say something? No. Very good. Uh, uh, as we also always say, uh, the children are in the hands of the parents. Uh, let's, let's, uh, let's work out the role we can do in talking to the parents. Uh, we've talked a lot about how uh, our team can do that. Uh, we, we are probably in this room because we feel more confident having these conversations than others do. We're going to take a break now. Let me see what I said we would do. Look, we're on schedule. That's magical. OK, we're going to come back at 25 past. Uh, I'm loving this and, it, and, and I hope you are too a bit. Uh, it's great to see you back at 25 past. I, ho I hope you oh, look there. We, no, no, if you if you watch the YouTube, you miss that, you see. You're joining now on the YouTube clip. You've got no idea what we were just talking about. That's the advantage of being here in person. Um, well, this, this is going brilliantly. I don't mean to sound surprised, but I'm, I'm hugely encouraged by, by what, what everyone's talking about. Um, there's always that thought, isn't there? I wonder what will happen. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, we have had a break. Uh, we're doing very well. Uh, we're well over halfway. Uh, let's push on. Uh, we're now going to hear from Chris. Uh, it is my pleasure that, that since we last had a big day out, I am no longer the director. I'm just one of the directors. Uh, Chris has joined us. So uh, the way it worked, look, Amy couldn't be happier. Can I quickly tell you all a story? I'll quickly tell you my story of why we need Chris. We had a team day about two years ago where the facilitator said, can everyone write down on a, on a post-it note what Faith in Kids needs to be do better at? And we didn't discuss it. Everyone wrote down on post-it notes. Honestly, every single person except me wrote down, uh, we're confused, there's no plan, the process keeps changing, the brief keeps changing, the deadlines keep changing, it never tells us anything. And I'd written down like, we'd love to do more online training and um, why don't we get a bus? 
Uh, so we learned from that that the whole team needed a lot more organisation, clarity and communication. That's why Chris is here. We're all delighted. Uh, Chris, can you just start, introduce yourself? Where, where are you sitting and how are you doing? Uh, I, yeah, hi, everyone. I am Chris. I am currently in Sheffield, well, north of Sheffield, a place called Peniston. Um, I am doing well. Yes. Thanks, Ed. Uh, do you want me to tell a little bit more about myself? Yeah, keep going, Chris. I'll interrupt when keep you get going. Forward. Okay. Uh, I am married. I have four children. Um, I kept on saying yes to my wife, which was a big mistake. And so now I'm lumped with four children, which I do love, obviously. Um, and we are kind of figuring out how to do life together as a family and ministering. And so for me, China Children's Ministry is very dear to my heart, uh, which is what drew me to faith in kids. I used to work for Christians Against Poverty. Uh, I was one of the directors there and then led, had the privilege of leading the Canadian uh, team over in Canada uh, for about three and a half years. Great. Chris, uh, I haven't asked you, uh, I haven't told you I'm going to ask you this question, so I'm going to take a risk. Uh, tell, yeah. me, tell me why you want to work for Faith in Kids. Why do I want to work for Faith in Kids? Uh, for me, um, I think it's one of the things that you said to me, Ed, uh, that, that really stood out to me in the process. and. And, and I, I don't say this is the case for every single church. There'll be a lot of people here listening to this and thinking that that's not the case in my church. And that's fine. Uh, I'm not saying this case everywhere, but I do see it uh, and I fear for it, which is that so often we focus on adults that we just kind of do a glorified godly daycare for children. And we forget that actually what we're meant to do as parents and as churches together, we're kind of equipped with this task of raising our children to really not just know Jesus in terms of biblical knowledge, but to follow, to be a disciple that goes on to make disciples. And, and for me, with raising my children, that's so dear to my heart that I want them to know that. I don't want to just put them in kind of a, a godly daycare and just forget about them. I want them to know that actually they are being raised and equipped to be a disciple of Jesus in 20, 30, 50, 70 years time. And, and that for me is the passion that drew me to Faith in Kids. Thanks, Chris. That's encouraging, isn't it? Chris, I've asked Chris to tell us something about vision, uh, which is Chris is that's what he's all about for faith in kids is, is what's our vision and how do we decide what we do? Chris is just going to tell us a bit more about that as what it might look like in a church or in any organisation. Chris, thank you. Great. Thank you, Ed. And I'm guessing you can all see my screen. Um, but yeah, this is just going to be a very kind of short session about vision and why it's so important. Uh, Ed will tell you that I talk about it a lot because I've seen firsthand how critical uh, and how important it is in ministry, um, in churches, in families, uh, and in certainly in times of uncertainty and, and in ministry. It's one of the things that can really ground us to understand where we are heading. And I know for many of us, even the word vision can be a bit of an alien concept, maybe one that's used a lot in business or corporate worlds and, and not so much in the church world. Um, and so what is vision? Well, vision is a picture of the future that guides our behavior. It drives our resources and targets our prayers. There is incredible power when we understand the vision that God is calling us all to in our various different contexts, whether that be in the church, whether that be in your family, whether that be in your children's ministry. Understanding that gives us an incredible power. And we often find, though, that I think vision can can easily be just subconscious. It can maybe maybe be within our heart that's driving us. But do we really know it? Have we ever articulated it? Do people around us that we're working with know it? Do our children's ministry workers and volunteers understand what we're all that all there to actually achieve? So understanding it, knowing it and communicating it is a critical first step to achieving it. I once had a holiday in North Wales. Uh, my mother-in-law, who'd previously been to this holiday home, uh, gave us some directions. And this was before the days of kind of sat navs everywhere. And, and in, there was no house number for the, the holiday home. And so she told us, when we get to Four Mile Bridge, the house is just there. The house is just there. Those were her exact, exact words. The house is just there. So I very naively assumed as a young 20 something, fairly newly married, I naively assumed that having never been there before, that I'd get to Four Mile Bridge and there would only be one house there. That 
there would be nothing else there. It'd be very obvious that I'd reached my destination. And so we drove in a lot of rain. We arrived. And of course, there's definitely more than one house there. And I, I, I remember thinking, looking to my wife, thinking, how could I have been so stupid that I really thought that I'd get to Four Mile Bridge and there'd only be one house there. And so we got there, but we didn't actually know our destination. We didn't actually know where we were going to be staying. It wasn't obvious. The destination was vague and the journey was therefore nearly pointless. Clarity matters. Vision matters. Knowing your destination is mission critical. And by the way, I have since stopped taking directions from my mother-in-law. She is useless at it. Now, that's a silly example, but imagine that's your church. Imagine that's your family. Imagine that's your children's ministry. All that effort you are putting in and others around you are putting in to love and to serve. But do you really know what you hope to achieve? Do they really know what you hope to achieve? See, clear vision gives us blinkers. It gives us that kind of uh, ability to just see like a laser focus ahead at where we're heading to to ignore the distractions of the world around us. So we're focused purely on that world that God is leading us to. And clear vision also helps us to make good decisions. Now, there's no shortage of good ideas out there. I'm sure we could come up with hundreds and hundreds of good ideas today around what we could do next. But is it the right thing? Is it the right thing for you in your context? Understanding your vision will help you to make those better decisions. Now, in my previous work life at Christians Against Poverty, I was once working with a church that were reaching out to so many marginalized people that every Sunday they had a large group of people. I'm talking like over 50 people that were regularly coming in and out of the service, in and out of the church building to go and have a smoke, have a cigarette. That was the reality of the lives and the beautiful mess uh, caused in that church because of the people that they were reaching. And they actually had a conversation as a church do we build a smoking shelter outside our church building because of what they were seeing happening? Now, for a lot of churches, for a lot of us, that could be months of deliberating and committee meetings and anguish and pain and theological debate and questioning. But for this particular church, it was very easy for them to make a decision because of their vision. And this was their vision. We want to be accessible to people from all backgrounds. We want to provide a safe place where people far from God can explore what it means to have a relationship with him. The clarity of their vision meant that it was not hard for them to decide what to do next. Now, I'm not saying that a clear vision is going to be the answer to all of your issues and challenges and problems, but it is a really good starting point to bring clarity not only to you, but to those around you working with you. And, and now really is a great moment in time in all of the uncertainty around us, recognizing, as we've been talking about this morning, that people's behaviors have changed, understanding the struggles that people are facing and engaging and coming back to church, the mental health struggles and challenges that are out there, the relationship issues, the isolation. Now is a great time to identify what are you trying to achieve and what is God calling you to do? And as you do that, here's just a few points to, to keep in mind. Um, I'm not saying these are a, a, an absolute essential guide, but these are a few things that I think will be helpful for you as you go through that process. Firstly, we've got to remember that this is about God. So start the process in prayer. Invite God to speak in the process, to guide the process, to bring wisdom to you as you navigate through finding your vision. Reflect. Look back at the past, understand the journey that you have been on and where you've come from in order to speak to where you want to go to in the future. Invite others, invite others into the process. Don't do it alone. Don't kind of shut yourself away in a room and just think I've got to come up with a vision statement by myself. It's not about that. It's about bringing the right people in. It's about bringing others in, other leaders, other church workers, other ministry workers, other members, trusted connections, Whoever you want to bring in, bring people alongside you to journey with you that can bring wisdom and guide uh, in that process. Look around you. Look at the context that you're operating in. We've all got to, to understand that we're operating in a world that none of us have ever navigated before. COVID is not going away anytime soon. We've got a shifting culture. 
We've got a rapidly changing society. We've got emerging societal issues that none of us have really had to deal with in the church world before, but are now being pushed front and center. Understanding that is really important. And then lastly, understand the needs. What are the particular needs in your church, in your community, in your town, in your children's ministry, in your family? And how are you uniquely placed to help them? And use that as a guide to then start to work through formulating your vision. And then please, really important, do this. Write out your vision. Ed will say it doesn't really matter. I will say it's really important. <laughs> Write it out. Understand it. Pin it up in front of you. Have it in front of your computer. Have it everywhere you go to understand and remind yourself what you're working for, what you're working towards, why you exist, what motivates you to get out of bed every morning. What's the world, that, that, that picture of the world that you're aiming to see? That is why it's so important. We need that constant reminder. And then as you do that, ask yourself this, is it Christ-centered? As we've said, this is about him. This is about Jesus bringing glory to his name. Is it Christ-centered? Is it a Christ-centered vision? Does it reflect him? Does it glorify him? And is it clear? Is it something that you can easily articulate and communicate to someone else? And could they then take it and articulate it and communicate it to someone else? Make sure it's clear. And then lastly, really important. This isn't location, location, location. This is communicate, communicate, communicate. As we know, you've probably heard this axiom that vision leaks. The reality is that we get so in we, we're inspired, we're on board, and then the reality of life hits and kicks in, or a crisis like COVID hits and vision suddenly drains out of us and we've forgotten all about it. Communicate, communicate, communicate. You can never say it enough. People need to hear it. People need to be reminded and re-inspired and re-energized and refocused and re-motivated to go and chase after that world that you've painted a picture of. And yeah, I pray that God will bless you as you go through this process and as you start to navigate and, and kind of think about vision in a different way. Uh, and if you do want any help, I'm more than happy to chat to you or to email and, and provide some, some kind of thoughts in a process. But yeah, God bless you all. And for now, back to you, Ed. Chris, thank you. You heard Chris's offer. Uh, Chris at faithinkids.org. Our email system is not that complicated. If you've seen someone today, uh, type that name in and at faithinkids.org. Let, let me just tell you uh, one story of where I've seen this recently. I was having a conversation um, with a couple who lead the kids ministry in their local church. It's a small church. They've maybe got uh, 10 to 12 uh, under 11s. That, that may be a huge number for some of you. But, you know, they see that a third of those children are their own family. Uh, their church has always said we want more children. The rest of the church are over 60. And as they bring in changes, particularly some all, all in services, that conflict I was talking about was happening. So we had a conversation about what's the next step. Uh, and they started to talk to me about, you know, should we? should we how do we do the tea at the end of the service where do people sit in the service how many songs do we have my answer was tell me the vision tell me what you as a church have agreed you are heading for they said oh definitely we want more families i'm i can't tell you the 12 words in their vision statement chris it must be right write it down but uh, they were able, Nick was able to tell me, our church are totally clear. We are four more families. We want them in our building. I said, OK, so that's your vision. That's what you keep communicating. That's what you keep talking about in every service. We are here today because the children are in the service today because. We're going to try a change today because. You keep telling people the vision. And suddenly, whether you have squash at the front or the back of the service is an irrelevance. Whether children sit in the front, in the middle, with their parents at the back is an irrelevance. In other words, you need to make a decision. But if the vision is clear, we as a church want more families in our building. We want to be a place where families feel welcome. So obviously we're going to change what we do next Sunday. Because at the moment, we can all see that's not happening. Uh, I, I found that helpful 
what Chris has just been talking about, to work through the practical issues of conflict in change. Vision is a way through conflict. Are we agreed on the vision? Can you tell me the vision? Okay, if that is the vision, how do you think we should make this step? How would you see it differently? That's a helpful conversation because that works out. Is it we're disagreed on the vision or is it that we're disagreed on the next step to get to the vision? Chris, thank you so much. Chris is very good at this. Chris at faithinkids.org, if you want more help with coming up with 12 words, never has 12 words been so difficult. Thank you, Chris, very much. Uh, if you've got questions to put into the chat, if you've got thoughts to put into the chat, there they go. Uh, do we have, Katie's asking, do we have a church-wide vision and a separate children's team vision or should the vision cover both? Thank you. This is such a helpful question, Katie. Uh, I, In my experience, I think it's great if they're closely linked. So, for instance, you might want a simplified version for the children's ministry team. But I do think as a church, the church vision is here. The children's ministry team is here because actually you want the children to know the vision. You want the children to know the vision. Wouldn't, wouldn't you want the children to go to bed saying, Mum, can we? I know what we've got to pray about. Our church wants to reach. Our church wants to be. Should we pray for that, Mum? So I think they have to be closely aligned. They don't have to be exactly the same words. OK. Brilliant. Chris, is that right? Do you think that is that true? Would you say said that differently? You're not. No, I think you're absolutely right. There has to be alignment in the how they work together. There will be slightly different wording because it's a slightly different form of ministry to children to, to the rest of the church, but it has to fall, fit within the overall direction of the church and where they're heading. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Always encouraging. Great. Um, I uh, wanted to say something very briefly um, on team. Uh, and then we're going to move on to look briefly at Christmas. Uh, what I wanted to say about team was we've um, we've had a great time understanding uh, something of what we can do, what we can't do, what belongs to Christ, what belongs to our leadership team and what belongs to us individually. Uh, I think there is a, a trend amongst people who lead children's ministry to find it hard to have the courage to have some of these conversations. Uh, so I remember when we were discussing this sort of thing, what is the unique contribution the leader of children's ministry can make? Uh, I had, I remember one very experienced uh, woman who I respect her ministry and what she does. I go to her for help. She said, Ed, but the people in my team expect me to sharpen pencils. You're telling me that shouldn't be me. She picked one example of a role she thought people in her church expected of her that she didn't feel she could give away. And, and she was just illustrating. So if that's my job, Ed, I can't see how I'm going to have time for building teams, walking with parents, visiting homes. Uh, I asked her, who in your church do you know who can sharpen pencils? Who has time? Who has time? Who can sharpen pencils? She gave me a long list particularly some retired folk who she thought would love to contribute to kids ministry, don't feel able to be in the room with children, do feel able to sharpen pencils, would love to contribute. In one minute, we solved the problem. Do you feel able to ask them to sharpen pencils? It took a while for her to say yes. That's the gap. That's the gap in our thinking. It became about her rather than about the ministry. Do I have the confidence to ask someone else to do a role I've been doing? Do I think I should ask them? Yes. Do I think this ministry needs me to ask them? Yes. Do I feel able to ask them? Oh, that's harder. Can I, uh, you don't need to listen to me, but can I just encourage you? you? The role you are doing is because your churches need you to lead. Your churches need you to take the initiative. Your churches need you to have some difficult conversations you're very good at it that's why you're in the role you've been trusted with it uh, do you think it's needed do you think there are others who could do this do you feel able to ask them please let me encourage you to say yes to all three uh, 
we are now going to hear from Paula. People are, are flying in with their visions. And uh, look, this is very encouraging. Look, Chris, they're living the dream. They've all got visions. Everyone's offering theirs. So, so I remember the first time I heard talk of vision, I mainly thought this is something for large multinational corporates and it's just smoke and mirrors. But this convinces us, I now don't think that. Uh, Chris has told us how to do it and a lot of you are telling you what yours is. So we're all convinced, brilliant. Hold the vision tight, communicate it a lot, pass the vision. Thank you. Paula, can you uh, unmute yourself, shout hello, tell us where you are and what just, you do for Faith in Kids. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I'm just checking because often I have sound issues. Hurrah, I've got the big thumbs up from Ed. <laughs> so in some ways, I feel like I've got the easy job today because I just get to unveil our new resources and be like, look at all of these glossy things that we get to give to you. Um, but after, after hearing what a lot of you have been saying and just hearing so much about um, things being so transitional and so many people just facing completely new situations and uh, I kind of think, gosh, okay, well, the danger is that um, all of you suddenly leave overwhelmed thinking, oh my goodness, Christmas is coming. Uh, can we do this? And so uh, I'm hoping that as we go into it, uh, you don't just suddenly think this is too much. We can't cope with Christmas because uh, the reality is it is 78 sleeps until Christmas. So maybe that uh, strikes you with fear or maybe it brings you joy. Uh, but what we've got to tell you today and what we get to give people um, as we lead up to Christmas is is huge joy and one big adventure. Uh, you're going to realize that obviously adventure is a very key word uh, this year for us. Um, Christmas is just a time of getting ready. It's a time of preparation. And, and so it's very easy for us to lose sight of uh, that first Christmas uh, and who Christmas is actually about. Uh, the clue is in the name. It's all about Christ. It's all about Jesus. And this year, we, we are going on an adventure. Uh, we're going back to that first Christmas. And we are going to meet some of the original Christmas characters. And the wonderful thing is, is that actually we get to look at them with fresh eyes and go, these were real people. They went through some crazy things. That first Christmas, I mean, it was like unexpected pregnancy road trips with like a heavily pregnant woman. People were getting visits from angels left, right and center. Uh, a newborn baby suddenly being visited by smelly shepherds and sheep. And then suddenly these like really wealthy people coming with all of their pricey presents. So the first Christmas, it was such an adventure and we're going to go back to that. And we are going to experience that first Christmas with some of them. Um, I know it's coming up to Christmas time. Obviously, John Lewis are going to be getting adverts out pretty soon. But you know what? Their, their advert does not compare uh, to what we have created. So I think Ed is about to... Oh, Ed is saying... Or if that is... Okay, Ed is going to show us... Look at this. So smooth. Two years on in Zoom, and we are smashing it still. Paula, Paula we, can, we can only hear you. We can't see you. We're going to play oh. this video. You can carry on. I can share things to screen if you want me to later. Here's the advert okay. for the adventure of Christmas. Great. Their adventure began one quiet night in a field a couple of thousand years ago. Three shepherds sat on a hill outside a town called Bethlehem. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy for all people. Today in Bethlehem, a saviour has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. What an adventure. They told everyone about the angels, the baby, the good news. Now it's your turn. Join the adventure of Christmas. The book, the advent calendar, the podcasts, 
and the Sunday materials. John Lewis. I mean, I don't feel like I need to say anything anymore. It's like, boom, there it is, Christmas. So uh, I'm going to take a few minutes now just to show you uh, some of those things, give you a bit of a picture of them. And I'm hoping that when I share my screen, you will actually see it. Um, but the main thing that I do want to be telling you today, as I try to, there we go. Uh, so the main thing is, as we go on this adventure of Christmas, uh, as I talk you through some of the resources that uh, we just mentioned there, books, podcasts, our, um, our resource package, we're trying to remember that all of these things, we've put them together in a way that uh, they support our greatest desire. And our greatest desire is always to see children trusting in Jesus eternally. And so everything that we have put together, this is our why. Why do we do it? We've put it together to support parents because they can't do it on their own uh, and support churches because you need help in supporting the parents. So all of these things, so I'm kind of, instead of just saying, look, I'm just going to scroll through a lesson and show you uh, everything that's in it or um, tell you the whole breakdown of uh, everything we're doing. Um, I would love for you to leave today knowing how these things all fit together, a bit like a puzzle, uh, to do this, to support parents and to support churches, because you're the ones who are going to be going back to your church leaders and saying, we need to be on this adventure. Uh, we, we've, got to, we've got to join in and we've got to get everybody else to join in. So the moment you've all been waiting for, the great reveal. Uh, the first thing that we're going to talk about is supporting families at home. And wonderfully, my buttons don't work. How exciting. There we go. <laughs> families at home. Hurrah. Uh, so the book, maybe you've bought yours already. Well done. I mean, I'm, I'm in South Africa, so I'm just going to wait patiently for somebody to send me one. Although actually, on that note, I know who supplies them. Uh, and I can give you a discount code. So that's exciting. All my South African friends, we can get uh, discounted rates uh, for this book. So families at home, we've got this great uh, Christmas devotional, 25 uh, devotions, simple, fun, but really hard focused. Uh, if family is going to be opening up the Bible, uh, it's going to be a Christmas time. Uh, your church leaders, they can stand up at the front of church, hold this up and say, families, it's possible. You can do it. Use this book. That is how we're going to be supporting families. And this year, how exciting. Check out these pictures. So we've, uh, we've added in pictures. Um, I was also thinking this, this can be your whole church. It doesn't just have to be families. Uh, you know, we've been talking so much about how actually we are feeling weak, we are feeling tired, we're feeling like uh, it's been quite an overwhelming two years. Uh, if you're just an adult who needs something that is um, a bit more achievable, why don't you do this as your Christmas Advent devotional? Um, you know, it's got pictures, it's got simple questions, but it's also got questions for your heart. So this, this will be great for your entire uh, church family together. Um, even more exciting, look at this. We have an advent calendar. Track your journey as you adventure towards Christmas. And um, can you handle it? We have stickers. Stickers this year, if you follow Ed on Facebook, you will discover that he is overwhelmed by the fact that we have stickers to go in our advent calendar. So work your way along the adventure, track your progress, stick on your stickers, have a wonderful time. These two resources is the best way that you can support families uh, at home, support them in getting into the Bible, support them in uh, raising their children to know and love Jesus. Now, the next thing that I'm going to talk about is our resource package that we have put together. And because we are just flying through this, and you might think, all I know is it's called the Adventure of Christmas. I missed everything else that she said. Uh, my best 
top tip for today would be go to our website. Uh, this package, a little taster, is already available for you to download. And so obviously you can see his little screenshot, go to our website, click on the main banner, it will take you to this page. Download the files. And the first thing to read, our series introduction, where that is going to help you understand how this is an adaptable teaching resource. We know things are uncertain. We know that, uh, you know, Christmas is still coming in a couple of months, 78 sleeps. Um, we don't fully know what Christmas is going to look like this year. Uh, you've, you've been through a few uh, Christmases and Easter's where um, things have changed rather last minute. And so maybe you are uh, wanting to prepare in a different way this year with your church family. So I would suggest Best reading this introduction to find out how you can adapt this resource to best, uh, best suit what your church needs. So you'll see that there's um, a little bit of a, an explanation of how you can use this in different ways. I'll talk you through a few of those ways right now. So we have um, put together four adventures. So our um, key players in the Christmas story. So we go on an adventure with Mary, Joseph, the shepherds and the wise men. So in our adaptable teaching resource package, you're gonna find uh, Sunday school lessons. So you can still use this in the traditional way. So what you have come to expect from a Faith and Kids Sunday school resource, you are still going to find in this resource. Uh, we've got illustrations, we've got worksheets, we have uh, the four lesson plans that will help you to be able to go through this adventure. Now, this is supporting parents as well, because this is reinforcement. So what parents are going through with their children at home, uh, or what your whole church family is going through, they then come to church, and they are having all of that reinforced. They are going through the adventure again. They are hearing from the people who care about them and their kids groups. And they're telling them the same thing. They're all pointing them to, uh, to Jesus. They're all showing them how God unveiled his incredible plan uh, of salvation and sending us as King Jesus. So have a look at those they are great uh, you'll be able to see lesson one already when you uh, download the taster pack uh, so another thing that we've done this is all inside this uh, adaptable teaching resource we've done an all welcome service so this is what you need to hand over to your church leaders and say to them you need to do this We've put together a whole script, a whole script that you could do as a service for, for everyone. So it is written to be enjoyed by adults, by children, by uh, Christians, by non-Christian guests. Everybody who will be sitting there will be engaged and will be taken on this exciting adventure. So the full script is there. We've made suggestions of uh, where you might want to include a mini sermon just to kind of uh, give the adults that little bit more, uh, but keep it really simple. So five minutes uh, of just helping them with understanding and five minutes of application. Um, if you are not doing this as a full service uh, script, what you could do is take out certain sections and use it instead as a five minute kid slot. Do it all together before your kids go out uh, to their groups. Or if you're not using it in church, you could use that uh, little kid slot with your kids all together. Um, so say maybe your Sunday school groups are now meeting as one big group. Uh, maybe your classes aren't how they used to be. Uh, use that as your Bible story idea to introduce them all to the story before you break into maybe smaller groups for discussion time. I also think that you could use uh, these as um, assembly scripts. If you're able to do a Christmas assembly, maybe go through them, have a look, see whose adventure do you want to uh, go through with the children um, and use one of these as, as an assembly. So really adaptable, really flexible. And that is all within um, those lesson packs. And then something that has been quite incredible over uh, the COVID pandemic times is being able to reach out to community um, and reach out to people on your streets and just get into community more. Uh, so when people were taking things to people, um, it just really did give you such a great opportunity to reach others. And what we are including 
this year is uh, the family adventure. Everybody gets to go on the adventure. So there will be a little booklet that you can print out where uh, you can encourage families to experience these adventures. Uh, it, it's a light touch of the story, the main thing, um, and a few things to do that uh, are simple. You don't really need much to do them. Um, enjoy a meal together. Pretend, pretend a king is coming to, coming to have dinner with you. Why don't you take turns trying to serve them as if they're royalty? So these are things that are so achievable that um, you, know, you could give it to your neighbor, give it to the, the families next door. And uh, if they aren't church going, if they're not Christian, it's not something that they're automatically going to be put off. It's something that they can easily do. Pop it in a bag, put in some crafty bits, put in some sweets, hand it out to everyone. So that is our community outreach tool. And then again, for supporting the families, uh, maybe families at home, maybe, maybe they're on the road, maybe this is the one for when you're in the car traveling or on the train traveling uh, to see family at Christmas. Don't forget that we have our podcasts. Uh, you can find them on our website. You can locate them via the little podcast dot thingy, my Bob. Uh, check out those. Um, because actually families need encouragement to know they're not, they're not going on the adventure alone. Uh, they get to adventure with others. So all of these things, uh, like I said at the beginning, all of it is to support, uh, to support parents. Um, and we want to support you as you support parents uh, so that children really are growing up to know Jesus. Um, and we would love for children this year to to experience the adventure of Christmas and just to be amazed by, by this little baby that was born in such a, an incredible way, uh, who is their king and their savior. And um, something that I didn't mention is that uh, with the, well, I sort of mentioned it, with the all welcome service where we said, why not do um, little mini sermon slants? Something else that you could do is, uh, see if your church leader could preach through these passages at Christmas time. Uh, maybe you don't do them as a full service. Uh, maybe instead uh, he preaches through them uh, while you all go through them at home and go through them in your Sunday school. And excitingly, we actually have somebody uh, here, Drew Waller. I think I'm going to be handing over to him in a moment. So I don't know if he is. Yeah, and if he is taking himself off mute. I am here, yes. Who is the senior, hooray, thanks, Drew. He is the senior pastor at Jersey Baptist. Um, he is, I think I'm correct in saying, planning on using this and preaching through the Adventure of Christmas resources. So I'm going to hand over to Drew. Thanks for chatting to us. And if you give us um, a little bit of an idea of what you're going to yeah, do. Yeah, thank you, Paula. Well, we are a mid-sized church of about 120 adults, 50 children on a Sunday. And like most churches, we see Christmas as a huge evangelistic opportunity. So we're going to have all age worship, Christmas themed outreaches, Christingle service and probably a dozen or so assemblies and carol services. So Christmas is full on for us. Uh, we also recognize that children's ministry drives a lot of what we do at Christmas time, uh, but also that by the time December rolls around, our children's ministry team are tired and stretched in terms of resourcing, which is why we've strategically chosen to prioritize resourcing and equipping our children's team uh, because they'll be carrying a lot of the kind of programmatic burdens for us at Christmas time. Uh, now, oftentimes in churches, the concept for whole church programs like the Christmas program comes from the senior pastor or in larger churches from those who are uh, organize adult teaching programs. Uh, and so this is basically a top down approach. Uh, this is often our church's default. I make the decisions on what the preaching plan is and then things go out to other folks. Uh, but we've actually recognized that at Christmas, it makes sense to prioritize the needs of our children's work. And so we're strategically choosing children's material to be the starting point and planning Christmas around that. And practically, this means we're starting with Faith and Kids, the Adventure and Christmas Resource Pack, and developing our adult program uh, from the resources provided by Faith and Kids. And we're doing this because we want everybody in church to be following the same program at Christmas. And we're also doing this because the reality is, is that it's relatively easy for me as a pastor to preach on any passage from the Bible, uh, but writing materials and, and designing linked up 
coordinated series is for Sunday school, all age worship, school assemblies, you know, church on Sunday, all that take home material that that takes a lot of work. And, and most of the years that burden falls on the children's team who are already weary, uh, which is why we're thrilled that Faith and Kids has actually done all that work for us. Uh, and, and so for us, I think it, it, we've made this strategic decision that we're actually going to allow children's materials to direct the rest of us at, at this one time in the year. Uh, you know, one thing I think that we have to recognize is that some people who are probably listening right now might not make all, all the decisions in their church. They're not feeling like they can make those decisions. And so that means that you've got to have a conversation uh, with the senior leaders in your church. Uh, and I think it's good to have a conversation just about the time cost and the pressures at Christmas that children's workers experience. But also, I think starting early, uh, I think is really important. So, you know, today's October 7th. Most churches won't be thinking about Christmas for another three to six weeks. If you make a suggestion to your senior pastor or to the leadership team at your church right now, you're proactively solving a problem they're going to have to deal with in just about a month's time. Can I just suggest also uh, tactically a little wisdom uh, uh, in how church leaders receive information from their staff team? You know, as a church leader, I get flooded with grand ideas from my staff team all the time. And some of those ideas are really good and some need a bit of tweaking. Most need a little bit of wisdom from me, uh, even if they're good ideas. Uh, but if someone comes to me from our staff team with a grand idea and I've never looked at it before, sometimes my natural de defenses go up, not because I don't like the idea, uh, but because I don't like making big decisions on the spot. And so can I suggest maybe a two-part approach? You know, if, if someone on our staff team comes to me and says, hey, Drew, we, have we planned Christmas yet? Uh, because if we haven't, uh, I've got an idea for how we might do our Christmas program this year. Would you mind me giving some thought uh, to our Christmas program and like, bringing back to you in a couple of days time a, a bit of a proposal? I'm never going to say no to that. And then, you know, the second part of that is, of course, uh, on a couple sides of A4, write down a proposal for Christmas, giving thought to what church has done in the past and how the faith and kids materials could be useful as a part of a children's program and also part of the, of the adult program. And that gives your church leader a, a chance uh, to digest what it is you're saying. Uh, and also it gives you the opportunity to be flexible and take feedback from them as well and use these resources to best fit your church. So I think that, that'd be my suggestions on that front, but that's a little bit of what we're doing. So we're using this resource uh, this year uh, and we are uh, kind of starting with our kids' work and then working our way out. And I'm gonna be preaching through the passages that are in the material. Drew, I would love to think someone else had a question for you. I was honestly gonna ask you the question, how, you know, how do we open the door? Give us a top tip. You gave us that, you're splendid. It's top secret, but we can put on a post and own hide it. It's, we can call it the senior minister two-step approach to having a conversation. We heard that first. Um, now, has anyone got any questions? Amy, you're looking at the chat. Has anyone got any questions for Drew before we let him go? I feel like he's just done a brilliant job. Drew, thank you for that. Uh, I honestly can't think of any questions, Drew. You have covered it. Thank you for explaining how you're thinking about it. And thank you for trusting faith in kids. Now, thank you, Ed, for all that you're doing. It's great to have you here. Now, uh, we've had some questions come in. Y you will have uh, a lot to process. Uh, and we have, particularly the last 10 minutes, Paula went slow, but there was a lot in there about what we're trying to offer. I want to encourage you to go to the website uh, at, and, and look through those four avenues, book, advent calendar, ad, ad, advent calendar, sorry, I'm going to pin that down. Show us some stickers. I'm, I'm honestly, honestly, are you ready? Advent calendar. Advent. This, and then. This is the greatest joy. There are the stickers, you see? Because let's be honest, if there are children in the room, we are all about the stickers. And, and honestly, it doesn't matter where you stick them, it's still a win. But with our incredible, which way? It starts at this end, Nazareth. It goes to Jerusalem. It ends at Bethlehem. Big starry Christmas day. Because I've got my own stickers, I'm just going to break all the rules. Christmas is going to literally happen in front of your very eyes. Ah, oh, look at that. 
and don't be the family that makes them fit exactly in a box. Let it go. Let it go. Okay. Now. Um, just, I think some people have asked about discount codes. Let uh, me ask, so let me answer that. Thank you, Paula. Uh, at the end, at the end, I'm just going to ask you to check in with us. If you lead children's ministry in your local church, we are going to be sending you a discount code for 10 copies or more. And we're doing the same in South Africa. I haven't yet worked out how to go global with Australia. It's the thrill to have you. But we'll absolutely have a discount code for the books and the advent calendar uh, for 10 or more copies. That discount code will be coming to you. Uh, very good. Um, now, it has been, we're, we're, we're plowing through. Uh, this session is only possible because of the generosity of the people who support us financially. Uh, when you download the Adventure of Christmas resources, you are going to find out that it took eight people, named people, to produce those resources. Uh, the biggest lie I try to correct is that Faith in Kids is about me. I, 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 am, I, am, I am just, I don't, I don't know what I am, but I'm, I'm the face people get to know, but it takes a lot of people to produce these resources who have worked very hard. We have made the decision to provide all resources for free to download to anyone. And in order to do that, in order to do more, we need more faithful people willing to join us on our journey. So other churches and parents can access what we are passionately believing are heart and life changing resources. We think it's a distinctive of what Faith in Kids is trying to do, that we want to reach the heart of families, not just tell Bible stories. We want to be an organization that disciples. Our vision is to equip and support the whole ecosystem around children so that they can be raised to know and follow Jesus eternally. Uh, we had a vision day last week. It was an intimidating day to discuss that vision because it seems massive. I am clear how hard pressed churches are and what a big task it is to make sure every child is discipled by parents and churches working together. But we prayed it through and we left more confident that Christ has it when we don't. We have wonderful people like you to share our vision. If you've come here, I suspect it means you understand more about faith in kids than anyone else. Uh, we have our most ambitious resource coming next year. It's the largest. I'm certain it's the best. It's by far the most expensive. And it will be coming out next year. And I believe it is necessary to unlock discipleship for children in the cultural situation we find ourselves. I'm most excited about it. I'm being a little secretive because we'll be having a huge launch and I'm told by people who understand these things more than I do that we should just drip feed the excitement to prevent you all exploding. It's only going to be possible by having people join us on the journey, by supporting us. You're here this morning because you share our vision. You know that Jesus Christ, following him eternally, is why we exist, to equip families and churches. That's us. Agreed? So here we are asking you to join us, to support us, five, ten, or twenty pounds a month. Uh, as everyone who's ever talked to you about giving to a Christian cause knows, the amount is less significant. It's the army of supporters that matters. We will go further with more together and the amount we entirely leave to you, that's not the significant part. The significant part is giving something to be part of it. Uh, whatever you can afford, it makes a huge difference. And it's wildly encouraging. It's wildly encouraging to the team to know that people think what we're doing is good enough to give to it. Uh, the link is going into the chat now. Anita, through the magic, is going to click on there. That takes you to our stewardship system. If you want to give directly to us if you have complexities you want to talk through with us please go to info at faithinkids.org but as anyone has ever said this before the important thing is to get giving there'll always be a better time there'll always be an easier time do it now thank you very much for that we are now going to our last breakout group 
Uh, the question I have for you is one next step. In your breakout groups, can you share one next step? Uh, what has struck you? What is left to ponder? What is the question? You're allowed to, the next step can be to go away with a question. That's fine. Okay. Anita, Vortex us out, filling in. I would love to hear six. Six quick fire next steps or questions people leave with. Uh, people are coming in. Do we have six quick fire, one sentence, next steps or questions? If you've got one, we're going to do this quickly. Time is ticking. Six quick fire, next steps or questions we leave with. Who wants to start us? Um, I'll go. I'm going to announce that I'm having a hot chocolate challenge month and I want to see how many hot chocolates I can drink with parents or children before Christmas, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. And tell the kids you need to invite me around to your house. You need to get your parents to, you know, or take me to a coffee shop or something. And so that I get to see people, I get to chat with people and the kids, but it doesn't seem scary. And actually the kids are driving a lot of it as well. And um, yeah. Abigail, you are magical. That's brilliant. Everyone loves that. Thank you, Abigail. How many hot chocolates can you have in a month? Perfect. Next, one idea, one question, one next step. Only one of them. Go. Order a bunch of adventure of Christmases to give out to church families. Thank you, Guy. Thank you for being convinced. It's lovely to see you. Thank you. Next. I was say that. Yeah, lots of advent calendars. Oh, yeah. it's all, Jane, it's all about the stickers. <laughs> That's saw, right, exactly. <laughs> I saw Elise asking, can we give out the, the stickers and the advent calendar? I mean, you can in that it's an advent calendar with 25 boxes and 25 stickers. One strategy could be you give away the advent calendar, they buy a book. So you, you can clearly have an advent calendar without a book. It, it just it, it's not got a lot of depth to it, but that's OK. And I really want to see people sharing pictures of their badly stuck on stickers. No. <laughs> the temptation to put those stickers right in that box is going to be so big. I want pictures on our Instagram page, share them with us, of like the worst stuck on sticker. Uh, okay. you've, you've got some people twitching at that thought. <laughs> <laughs> Need to let it go, people. Let it go. Two, two more quick next steps, questions or places you're stuck. You can just say them. You, you might not get an answer. You won't get an answer. I promise you won't get an answer. Ed, with the advent calendars and the books, um, obviously for families, kind of like get them out. But I was thinking for toddler groups, could we possibly, if they had the advent calendars, use our social media site to kind of guide and prompt them? Yeah. To yeah. Do it that way? That must be right. That must be right, Sophie. No one from the Good Book Company is listening. But um, I'm absolutely certain there are great things you can do to help your church. Creativity and serving the Lord must be the goal. Thanks, Sophie. One more. We're doing brilliantly. We're running out of time, but it's too much fun. We think we should um, give them to not just people with children, but all the church, the Advent calendar and book, and get them to work through them as well. I mean, let's, I don't know, are you, are you Jean or Rachel? I'm Jean. Jean. Everyone secretly loves stickers. Of course they do. Of course, everyone. Everyone needs stickers. I'm all about the stickers, Jean. Thank you. Go and do it. Go and do it, Jean. Now, we're, we're now on to our wrap ups. OK, so look, I'm not I'm really not going to keep you. We're now on our final thoughts and, and what you call it. OK, let's share that. Go. OK, so uh, a quick notice. Sheridan, are you ready? Uh, in March. Five Thursdays, uh, I am running with Cornhill training sessions. It's a course, so it's all five in centre of London. I'm actually sorry because Zoom means people could join us last year from anywhere. So I'm, I'm sad that this is now a probably Southeast yeah. England yeah. thing. But if you want to join me five Thursday afternoons in March, it is the five Thursdays in March. 1.30 to 4.30. Uh, Anita is putting a link in the chat now for how you book. Sheridan, you did it last year with me. Give us two sentences on what you thought. 
Hi there. Yeah, so I, I got stitched up by my vicar to, to come to this and I was regretting it at first. And I was like, why am I here? Uh, I got to the first session and obviously we had Ed talking about sort of his vision and, and things for children's work. And it was very inspirational at, at, at the start. And I was like, gosh, I, I don't know if I can talk to kids about the Bible. And basically uh, throughout the sessions, I was sort of convinced that actually I was able to share my faith with kids and share stories to kids and you know t speak to kids confidently about talking in in Sunday school whether it was before I would definitely shy away I, I didn't know how to talk to kids um really so you know it was um yeah it was brilliant brilliant so thank you Ed. Sheridan lovely you thank you for that Sheridan so if you want to join me there's 10 places okay uh info at faith in kids to ask more questions or click the link in the chat to book yourself on if you know if you know it's for you. No minimum level, no prior training necessary. Uh, anyone can do it in any role. I'm sorry, it's geographically limited. We we are thinking about how we do this sort of thing, not geographically limited. I'm so nearly there. Thank you for bearing with me. Uh, are you the leader of the children's ministry in your church? I ask this every time because you are the people we want to post things to. So it's worth you giving us your name, your church, and your postal address of the church building where we can post things to you. Sorry, the, the, the church office, okay? Please, can you send those? If, you have, if you've done it already, you don't need to do it again. We're up to about 120. Uh, we are about to post something. So we do need to know where you live if you lead the children's ministry in your local church. If you're in South Africa, can you email that information to Paula. She's in Durban. I'm not sure we mentioned that. She's in Durban. She wants to hear from you. She will give you discount codes for South Africa. Okay. I think we are so nearly there. Okay. The next date, 4th of November, go to the Faith in Kids website to book yourselves in. We'll be talking about Christmas. Uh, between now and then, we've got more videos to share. The recording of this will be available straight afterwards. I think we're stopping there. We're not doing this. The, good, we're there. So in that case, I'm going to pray and you'll all be gone very soon after. So if you want to hang around to ask a question, you're very welcome. Dear Father, we thank you that you are, you are the Lord. We thank you that Christ is our good shepherd, and we thank you that by his spirit, we can speak your words into the hearts of children. Father, we pray we would know how to lead in uncertainty, lead in weakness, and lead those sheep who are a long way from home. Be gracious to us, Father. We pray if we feel overwhelmed, you would allow us the clarity and the love of others to focus in on one next step. Thank you, Father, that you are the good shepherd. Your son is on his throne, so we don't need to be. Amen. Amen. You are a joy. Thank you very much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you on the 4th of November. You're free to go. We all secretly wish we didn't have to go. <laughs>